in an industry that focuses on creating iconic moments in order to attract its audience. For one particular moment to stand out, as you can imagine, it takes something extraordinary. Something so astonishing, over the top or downright dangerous for the moment to stick in fans' minds for years to come. I say this in an attempt to give you an idea of the magnitude of the topic we're about to discuss. On the surface, this is just a recollection into a night in 1997 in an arena in Canada, a moment where one wrestler won a match over a rival, something which we've seen countless times across the wide breadth of wrestling history. Wrestling's fake, right? So why does it even matter? The Montreal Screwjob is not just a historic pro wrestling moment that stands out from the masses, it is in fact, quite possibly, the single most important and memorable moment in all of pro wrestling's history, and here's why. The referee, uh, Earl Hebner, when Sean got Brett in the sharpshooter, which is Brett's finishing maneuver mm -hmm. and his uh, submission maneuver. Mm -hmm. Uh, the referee rang the bell as if Brad had submitted. I missed two shows in 14 years. Um, I worked myself up from the very, very bottom of the cards as a no-name, you know, um, plus one other match, as I remember, to all the way to the very top. And I think I set a standard that uh, no other wrestler can ever, will ever accomplish or, or, or beat what I, I was the Cal Ripken of the WWF. <laughs> And uh, I think even from a schedule standpoint, I did 250 to 300 days a year. I was away from my family for Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving, year in and year out. And I, I paid, you know, and I was, I've been financially rewarded by wrestling, and I'm, I'm glad of that. But at the same time, I made tremendous sacrifices to, to be a first-rate uh, wrestler for this company. Bret Hart, known for his world-class in-ring skills, the Hitman is arguably the greatest technical wrestler in the history of WWE. The excellence of execution, once coined by Gorilla Monsoon, didn't take long for others to come to terms with the moniker. In an industry built around bravado and hyperbole, the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be may not be everyone's opinion of this generation-spanning wrestler, but his character at least deserves to be discussed in those upper circles of grappling's elite. His humble yet determined attitude towards his rivals and his honest and truthful look out onto the wrestling industry meant that he was both appreciated and respected both on television by fans in the arenas around the world and in the locker room with his peers. I think it's hard to differentiate between your wrestling character and your real character. You kind of end up being both. I've always been my wrestling character in and out of the ring and in and out of the dressing room and I was always really respected in the dressing room by other wrestlers. Clad in contrasting neon glasses, singlet and trademark leather jacket, the pink and black attack fit nicely into the 90s new generation aesthetic amongst other colourful characters of the time such as Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan. The pink was something that they liked. For those kids, the pink and black and the whole look with the sunglasses and the leather jacket was the right kind of hero they could get behind, and I think that really set me apart from everyone else. White skin, brown hair, and a glittering pro wrestling career which rose to prominence within an iconic tag team, these are the similarities which are shared between Bret Hart and one of his greatest rivals. In almost every other conceivable way, these men are complete opposites. The heartbreak kid thinks he's cute, he knows he's sexy, he's got the looks that drive the girls wild, he's got the moves that really move them, he sends chills up and down their spine, he's just a sexy boy. Where Brett was proud of his noble attitude and no-nonsense approach to in-ring combat, Shawn Michaels was the opposite, arrogant, flashy and always certain of his own abilities. The on-screen character of the heartbreak kid was so charismatic that his persona even began to seep out into the real-life world of Shawn Michaels. 
As part of the Rockers tag team in the AWA, Sean drew the attention of fans and fellow wrestlers alike with his unbridled desire to entertain the crowd and ever-growing ability to create some of the greatest pro wrestling matches of all time. When Sean betrayed Marty Jannetty in one of the most brutal tag team breakups ever, Michaels quickly became public enemy number one. However, as fans around the US came to shows to boo and show their disgust at Sean's despicable actions, in the back of their minds, they knew it was hard to hate a man who was just so damn good. I'll go out there and give you a show like you've never seen. Why? Because I can. It started out not very competitive. We were friends, uh, the respect was there, very mutual. Just like, I cannot believe that this happened. A time limit draw between two teams who the fans cared little about. Not the epic fairy tale opening that perhaps this bitter feud deserved. However, all stories have to start somewhere. And as this WWF's match began, we have the first encounter of this now historic feud. On the 25th of November 1989, inside of Madison Square Garden in New York, as Bret Hart was joined by Jim the Anvil and Shawn Michaels paired with Marty Jannetty, the teams came face to face. Nobody could have predicted the way in which these two men's paths would be contorted around one another over the next decade. Both men tried their best to impress and the fans in attendance got to witness two babyface factions battling it out for nothing more than respect and a little momentum on their way to the tag team title belts. And he always, you know, heck, when he and I had a conversation, he always said, look, I see you being the, you know, the next guy. February of 1990, the start of a new decade and the start of a new feud. At WWF's Wrestling Challenge in Florida, Shawn Michaels faced off against Bret Hart for the first time in a televised match. Both men impressed with their chemistry between the ropes and put on a quick but effective bout full of quick reversals and smooth chain wrestling. The fans in attendance got behind the actions and seemingly were in support of both wrestlers. This match was a trial of sorts for these performers, seeing how they would fare in front of a crowd without their partners. However, the Rockers and the Hart Foundation were far from being separated. This fact was evident when the fight ended with an interruption by Marty Jannetty and Jim the Anvil Neidhart, causing a no contest call from the referee. The keen-eyed view will have also noticed the referee who made the call at the end of the match, Earl Hebner. How fitting that the first battle between Michaels and Brett in one-on-one -on -one competition would be called to a sudden halt by the same man who would do just that seven years later in Montreal. I see this this hero being trashed in the ring and, and humiliated and done in such a fashion, like the fact that Shawn Michaels had, had me in my hold, just to humiliate me, and it was done in a way to kind of I guess Vince McMahon wanted to show me that uh, he has the power to tear me down and destroy me. Uh, he built me, he's created this monster and it's his right to tear it down and that's not true. Later in April of 1990, the two teams faced off once again on WWF Saturday night's main event. The Rockers and Hart Foundation once again showed their potential as both tag teams and singles wrestlers with some nice chain wrestling on display from the quartet. Fans in Austin, Texas witnessed two teams who were evenly matched on the night in a contest which ended with a double disqualification, leaving the question of who was the better unit still to be answered. Broke my heart. I think if you look at my the expression on my face, you'll see the expression of a guy that gave everything uh, to be crapped on at the very, very end. For I, I'll never understand why they did to me what they did. When the Rockers challenged the Hart Foundation to two out of three falls in October of 1990, fans were treated to a real wrestling clinic. The previous matches between the two teams had allowed all four men to hit their strides. All of these performers played their parts expertly as Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty finally overcame the odds and won in a hard-fought contest. Although fans back then at the time wouldn't have known this as the match was never aired on television. During the bout, one of the ring ropes had forced the turnbuckle loose and caused for the confines of the ring to collapse. Even though the wrestlers managed to continue and showed real professionalism to negate the unexpected, WWF owner Vince McMahon felt that the accident with the ring construction made the company look cheap and unprepared. 
especially as both teams had to change their offense on the fly. With WWF television being filmed weeks ahead of its air date, this meant for a brief while the Rockers took with them the belts and even defended it against Paul Roma and Hercules before the boss decided that the original title change match wouldn't air on television and the Hart Foundation would continue on as champions until a rematch could be scheduled. Since then, Shawn Michaels has spoken about how he believes the Hearts got into Vince McMahon's ear and persuaded him to hold off on the title change. In the time after November 3rd, no rematch happened between the Rockers and the Hart Foundation and thus the title never officially changed hands, something which due to the fact that Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty never went on to hold the tag team titles in WWF stings all that much more. In the modern day, you can see the full unaired title change on the Shawn Michaels Story DVD, which is interesting since the video was never edited and never and commentary was never added, a real hidden gem for those diehard wrestling historians out there. By March of 91, just a week after the Hart Foundation lost the tag titles at WrestleMania 7 to the Nasty Boys, Brett and Sean faced off once again in only the second ever match at the Tokyo Dome to feature only WWF wrestlers. The Hart Foundation defeated the Rockers in front of an excitable crowd, a hot start to a crossover show known as WrestleFest. Presented by short-lived promotion SWS and WWF simultaneously, this fast-paced tag team bout was filled with great ring psychology and expert grappling and really allowed time for the match to breathe. This version is the best quality I can find. I'm not sure if this series is available officially anywhere else online. If it is, I couldn't find it. However, that being said, just the sheer spectacle of seeing classic WWF wrestlers such as Ric Flair, The Undertaker, Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan facing off against notable Japanese wrestlers of the period such as Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Minoru Suzuki and Genshiro Tenryu makes SWS WrestleFest and their entire SWS Tokyo Dome show run worth a watch. In December of 1991, Shawn Michaels had become the clear standout from the Rockers tag team and decided to go it alone. A moment now infamous for its shocking nature as Michaels threw Janetti into a glass window pane, causing blood to ooze from his once close ally's head. Since then, the moment's gone on to be a blueprint for how to dramatically split up a partnership as well as an iconic part of pro wrestling history. At the time, it meant that Sean had a chance to branch out on his own and began to spread his wings as a performer, growing more confident in the ring and out. Even with all of our differences, it ain't an enviable place to be. And we had personal problems with each other. The whole nother thing to live it all out on a pay-per-view frickin' TV. Um, from my perspective, I guess that me being the next guy happened sooner than he wanted it to, or that he thought it should. Now, having been on the other side of that, I understand that. You know, having to face that there's a guy that's doing better than you and drawing money and drawing ratings, tough pill to swallow. Michaels was now accompanied to the ring by his sensational valet, Sherry, the pair forming a unique duo, with Sherry even lending her voice to the original version of the Heartbreak Kids entrance theme. As both Michaels and Hart continued to improve and make their way up the card, by 1992, Bret Hart was the Intercontinental Champion, with the belt on the line against his now reoccurring enemy. The first time these two wrestlers would come face to face for a title belt came on primetime wrestling in Ottawa, Ontario. Even with Sherry at his side in matching glittery outfits, Michaels still came up short as Brett managed to retain his WWF Intercontinental title in his home country of Canada. Even when he got the championship, I mean, I was very happy for him because we, you know, we felt like it was a turning over, a new beginning. By July of 1992, the pair's rivalry had started to heat up with the two men now facing off enough times to be able to consistently amaze with the quality of the wrestling in their matches. 
Shawn Michaels had begun to exude charisma on the microphone and sexiness in his movements and costumes, but he had also started to show that his in-ring work justified his cocky attitude. Bret had now become widely accepted as an in-ring general, his general's leather jacket proving that, earning the moniker of the best there is, the best there was, and best there ever will be. When Bret approached Vince McMahon with an idea which he had taken from his time wrestling for Stampede in Canada, the boss didn't need any convincing. WWF would put on their very first ladder match, a stipulation which was, and still is, extremely dangerous. A match type which takes a certain type of wrestler in order to make it work, one who possesses great agility and balance in order to work with the ladder safely, as well as an excellent understanding of ring psychology in order to make the story of the match. Vince knew that both Sean and Brett possessed these skills amongst many others in abundance, and thus, on an untelevised and little marketed event, the two men laid the foundations for the modern day WWE ladder match. Both men were inventive with their use of the ladder throughout the match, and every time one or both of them made their way up towards the belt, the crowd couldn't contain their excitement. A real energetic reaction from the live fans certainly adds to the atmosphere, making this lost match worth hunting down and watching. Obviously, this match is much less known and less well respected than the next ladder match that Shawn Michaels would have, but nevertheless, as Bret Hart climbed the ladder in the middle of the ring and retrieved his intercontinental belt, fans in attendance knew they had just been a part of something revolutionary. In the summer of 1992, Bret Hart faced off against his brother-in-law Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog, inside a packed out Wembley Stadium in London, where the hitman lost the belt in a sun-soaked classic in the UK. The British Bulldog seemingly handed the belt due to the location of SummerSlam, eventually lost the belt to Shawn Michaels. By November of 92, Bret Hart held the WWF title and Shawn held the Intercontinental belt. With the two men still heavily involved in a rivalry, Shawn beating Bret's family member had made it feel personal, and as the pair came face to face on main event, Mean Gene Okerlund had to do his best to stop the confrontation from boiling over. Soon after, Sean challenged Brett at the upcoming Survivor Series pay-per-view, one-on-one, -on -one, title for title. Two athletes who were just hitting their prime with bags of experience and the world at their feet. Both had swarms of adoring fans following them to shows and autograph signings around the country. Brett had always stayed true to his good guy persona, never willing to cheat and always relying on hard work and skill to get him to the top. Sean was growing even more arrogant, flashier, and his in-ring work reflected that. His betrayal of Marty was still in fans' minds, but somehow, through all of his boasting and showboating, the fans could never seemingly bring themselves to properly hate Sean. With the crowd split in Ohio, Brett retained his belt in a half-hour classic, the best match that these men had shared thus far in their career, and a taste of the almost unfathomable levels of skill we're about to witness from the pair. What are the chances that they set up this thing, and the only place that the possibility to end the match is me having him and his maneuver? The following November at Survivor Series 93, one of the key stories leading into the event was the ongoing feud between Brett and Jerry the King Lawler. But with Lawler unable to compete due to an ongoing legal dispute, the details of which I won't discuss in this video, Brett was left without a match. The advertised bout was set to take place in the classic Survivor Series format of two themed teams, one headed by Brett, featuring his brothers Owen, Bruce and Keith, the other with Jerry the King Lawler leading out a team of masked knights. However, with Lawler out, Sean replaced him, but due to the last minute switch, WWF didn't have time to organise and advertise Michaels to have another team with him. So that night in Boston, we were treated to a lacklustre bout between the Hart brothers and Shawn Michaels and his knights, whose identities were hidden behind lucha masks as I think even Vince McMahon knew these characters were going to be a one-off. If you're interested, Greg Valentine was the Blue Knight and Barry Horowitz was the Red Knight 
and Jeff Gaylord was the Black Knight. Shawn Michaels ended up walking out of the match for a count out, handing the victory to the opposing team. The match was less about the story between Brett and Shawn. The drama of the story came when Owen Hart was eliminated at the fault of team leader Brett, which created tension after the final bell and led into their now iconic feud moving forward. A month later in December of 1993, the next match between the pair took the stakes to the next level. The animosity between the two men had grown to a point where a regular singles match couldn't confine the aggression. Outside interference had caused a number of non-finishes to several matches along the feud thus far, and so the WWF sanctioned a match in Germany between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart inside of a steel cage. In a short match which didn't have any room to gain momentum, Hart was victorious over Michaels in a timely 11 minutes, the hitman making the escape over the top of the cage when Michaels got his boot and tights trapped in the cage's construction, leaving him hanging upside down with little recourse. The match itself which took place as part of a WWF European tour was held back from television and only saw the light of day when a Coliseum home video featured this hidden gem as part of a Best of Germany feature VHS. This would prove to be a point at which all parties felt it valuable to take a break from the rivalry as Michaels and Hart went their separate ways over the next 18 months. Like he sees Sean and it makes him sick because his children are watching. He doesn't want his children exposed. Brett exactly. speaks the truth. He will always be my hero. He's he always my always hero. Our I love him with all my heart. The odd couple of Brett and Sean paired up once again to face off against Jacob and Eli, the Blue Brothers, in a tag match. A twist on the pre-existing formula allowed a chance for these two now well-travelled foes to put aside their differences and show what they can achieve as a unit. On an untelevised dark match, Brett and Sean easily beat the Blue Brothers with little resistance when Hart applied his patented sharpshooter submission. Not a memorable match by any stretch, but notable as one of the lesser seen instances of Hart and Michaels both working as somewhat good guys in the ring together. And I still am the best. And I gave that gave the WWF um, 14 years of maybe the greatest wrestling matches in the history of the of the of the business. The next time we'd see the pair in a ring together was when they teamed up to face off against Jerry the King Lawler and Hikushi in an untelevised match. Jerry Lawler got the crowd riled up before the contest got underway, and the match had a great pace. Little was known as to why this match never made its way to television, as during the 10 minute bout, the wrestling on display from Brett and Sean is stellar, and the same can be said for the character work from The King and Hakushi. Brett ends up getting jumped at the bell and is on the receiving end of a serious beating for the majority of the contest. The excitement rises as he tries again and again to make his way towards his partner Michaels. With Brett staying true to his no cheating rule, he's frustrated when Michaels begins to bend the rules. As Sean gets the hot tag, the crowd erupts as he manages to swing the momentum in the side's favour. The bell rings as Hart forces Hakushi to tap out to the sharpshooter as Brett and Sean reluctantly share in the celebrations of victory. It was around this time that Sean Michaels began to see the light. He had moved away from the more extreme sides of his personality and had become one of the fan favourites inside of WWF, cementing his new stance with his move away from the loss to Diesel and his heel valets, choosing instead to be paired with Jose Lothario, an experienced veteran of the ring. During a trip to Syracuse, New York, Shawn Michaels finished up his match against the British Bulldog and the pair, joined by X-Pac Shawn Waltman, left the show in search of celebration. After one too many drinks, the trio were invited to a local nightclub where they continued to drink and chase after women. Shawn Michaels found himself belligerently drunk, pulling shapes with a group of young women on the nightclub dance floor, one of whom Michaels invited back to his hotel room, only to be met by a rather large local man who intervened. Shawn, being the showman he always has been, continued to dance and thrust his way around the club drawing the ire of a few others and causing friction with the locals. Outside, as Sean attempted to leave, he was met in the car park by the man who had previously accosted him and a few of his equally large friends. 
one man reportedly shouted. What are you hanging around with those loser wrestlers for? They're all a bunch of fakes. At Sean and the women he was with before the tension began to escalate. With no friends in sight, Sean threw a floppy right hand towards his aggressors to no avail. He was set upon by the now angry group who sent him away with a concussion and a split lip. The real life event played into the WWF show as the story was greatly exaggerated and grew to how Michaels had been set upon by an angry mob and valiantly fought till the last. This drew enormous sympathy from the wrestling fans and helped push Michaels further towards the light. WWF pushed the story so far as to have Sean collapse during a promo segment in the ring, really driving home the seriousness of his injuries. Michaels returned to WWF at the start of 1996. He managed to win the Royal Rumble match for the second time in a row and set up a much anticipated rematch with the now world champion Bret Hart. The build to the match was brief in its screen time, however, an excellently edited video package which aired in the lead up to the WrestleMania 12 main event summed up everything that this match meant to Michaels and to Hart. The story was once again built around the two performers core ideals, Bret the hard working athlete who was always willing and able to defend his championship and Shawn Michaels the other side of the wrestling coin focused on entertaining the masses at all costs with his over the top charisma and heart stopping in ring ability. I'm not sure if those who were writing these stories within WWF at the time knew just how masterfully nuanced it was, perhaps they did. Regardless, the idea that Bret and Sean were enemies had, and still to this day has, so many layers. On the surface, two wrestlers determined to be the best, fan favourites in the prime of their careers about to set the world alight with the main event of Wrestlemania. But as we look deeper, we see that Sean and Bret are in a way, the yin and yang of pro wrestling, the sports of Bret Hart and the entertainment of Shawn Michaels brought together to represent this wild form of entertainment in its entirety. As Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart are both performers in WWF and real people, the line between what they believed should be happening in the ring and how they acted outside of it began to blur. WWF was moving towards a more adult approach to its presentation, one filled with sexual innuendo, graphic violence and a grittier feel. This new way of presenting pro wrestling was spearheaded by Shawn Michaels. Away from the bright neon, realistic and oftentimes slow approach which had been led up to this point by Bret Hart. The match would determine the direction of the WWF on screen and behind the scenes and that sense that the wrestling landscape was changing can be felt when watching WrestleMania 12. Um, it's got a lot more raunch here, a lot more sexual, the show's very very sexual and you know, I think in a bad way I don't think you watch wrestling for sex I don't think um, it's I don't think it's become something presentable to your children like like my kids won't watch the show anymore none of them not even the teenagers and it's it's just become something I don't really want to associate myself with two of the most beloved good guys in all of the industry their twisted and tangled paths leading up to this epic moment face to face on the biggest stage in all of pro wrestling WrestleMania 12 with Bret's WWF title on the line in a match which some say is the greatest of all time. A 60 minute Iron Man match in the main event in front of little over 18,000 fans whose enthusiasm on the night could trick those merely listening into thinking the crowd was double that size. As Shawn Michaels made his now infamous descent via zip wire over the crowd, arena lights catching the sequence of his attire and scattering strobes of beaming light into our television, it felt different, it felt special. Brett hit a pile driver which showed that he was putting every last drop of effort into his defence. Michaels made a diving leap to outside of the ring, landing a picture perfect crossbody. At the time, in wrestling where that kind of move was relatively still fresh. I know as a kid watching, I felt like I'd never seen anything like that high flying stunt in my life. An absolute classic and clinical display of two of the greatest wrestlers to ever exist, several mini stories happening inside of one match, an absolute must watch for all those wanting to see how far technical mastery in the ring, both physical and emotional, can be pushed.
The end of the match came as the 60 minute time limit closed out, with Brett managing to ensnare Michaels in the sharpshooter with the clock showing its final seconds. With both men tied, if Michaels tapped out or submitted, Brett would have been declared the victor. After a gruelling hour of wrestling, even as a Bret Hart fan, I was willing on Sean not to lose in the last moments. For me, both men had excelled and it would have been a harsh outcome for the challenger who looked as good as Brett throughout the match. As the clock fell to zero, Brett believed that Sean had submitted, declaring himself the victor and making his way to the back. However, the camera clearly showed that Sean had not been defeated and Brett was met on the ramp by then WWF President Gorilla Monsoon who announced there must be a winner. Now Brett was furious and set to work dismantling Sean, working on his lower back and taking complete control during the now sanctioned overtime period where the next pinfall would win the match. One last drop of energy from Sean allowed him to leap over Brett in the corner and deliver a glancing sweet chin music super kick, one that merely disorientated Hart and knocked him back into the turnbuckle. A second more decisive kick from Sean sent Brett's back to the mat. In Anaheim, California, that night the boyhood dream has come true as Sean pinned Brett 1, 2, 3 and won his first ever WWF World Championship. As for my finest WrestleMania moment, that happened at WrestleMania 12 with Shawn Michaels. I think it stands out as the best pro wrestling match. Kudos to Shawn too, we both made that a classic match that will never ever lose its shine. I've watched it maybe 10 times in the last 10 years. The drama of me staggering back up to my feet, still fighting then taking the big boot for Sean's finish, and the drama, frustration and emotion my fans must have felt was huge, it still stands as one of the most dramatic matches in Wrestlemania history. Hunter's words were, if he doesn't want to do business, maybe we should do business for him. A moment which solidified both men as the best in the world, at the height of their abilities to work as a unit in the ring. With the goal of creating stories which will last a lifetime. The last time that Brett and Sean would see eye to eye on a human level and from here, things only go downhill. For Brett Hart and Sean Michaels, the road ahead is a complex one, full of lies, deceit and betrayal. He sent me documents and he, he just, I remember the, the first time he just goes, I'm gonna tell you all this and he goes, and everything I'm gonna tell you, in time you're gonna know that it's all true. After WrestleMania 12, things began to change. Bret Hart losing his cherished belt to his most bitter rival destroyed not only his reputation as the best wrestler in the company, but also destroyed Bret's belief that hard work and skill would always trump showmanship in the ring. This led to a point of re-evaluation for the hitman who was clearly dejected following the biggest defeat of his entire career. On an episode of Raw in April, we saw a video package showing Brett taking time away from the ring in order to think things over, and a brief segment of Brett explaining how his feelings were hurt following the loss of his belt. Over the following months, Brett was off screen, given time to rehab a few of his niggling injuries and allowed time to spend with his family, whom he'd spent so many weeks and months away from during his historic rise to the top within the WWF. By October, fans were beginning to wonder if Brett would ever return to form, or if indeed he would even be returning to wrestling. After all, Hart's rabid fans had never had to wait so long to see their hero, and had, in part, become fans of the man and the wrestler due to his ability to consistently perform at the highest level, week in and week out. When the hitman appeared on Raw in October, the wrestling world welcomed him back with open arms amidst, spe amidst speculation surrounding his career. In November, Shawn Michaels faced off against Psycho Sid at Survivor Series. After Sid attacked Shawn's manager with a video camera, Shawn became distracted and eventually fell to a wicked powerbomb from Sid and lost the WWF belt. What bothered me more than anything, I'll say this, what bothered me more than anything is, is Vince was adamant that I deny it. 
that he wanted to take responsibility for it. And I could not convince him, like, dude, you are not going to. Right. Because, you know, you're Vince, no one's going to blame you. And even if they do, they're going to do it quietly. They're going to blame me. By December, Brett was next in line to challenge Sid for his newly won title. In a match at In Your House, one in which Brett had the upper hand, the action spilled out of the ring and out to the ringside area, which, not so coincidentally, was where the guest commentator for the match, Shawn Michaels, happened to be sitting. After an altercation next to the commentary table between Hart and Michaels, Shawn became enraged. Sid had followed Brett outside of the ring and shoved Michaels in the face, which pushed the heartbreak kid to boiling point. As Brett and Sid climbed back into the ring, they were followed by Michaels, who clambered up on the ring apron. As Psycho Sid threw Brett towards the ropes, he slammed into Shawn Michaels, leaving Brett temporarily hunched over, in the perfect position for Sid to grab Brett and forcefully execute a powerbomb to retain his belt. A moment which nowadays is played out and repeated ad nauseum. However, at the time, the interference from Sean following the altercation perpetrated by Brett only served to deepen the divide not only between the two wrestlers but also between their respective fan bases. In what I consider to be the start of a masterful piece of storytelling, we see a desperate Brett on his knees outside of the ring, the usually clean cut athlete who would never normally dream of using an illegal weapon to win a match for just a brief second, can be seen grabbing at Sean's chair. Would Brett have used the chair against Sid if things had played out differently? As we're about to see, this is a subtle indicator of the change which Brett was about to undertake. On Raw the next week, all of the subtlety disappeared. As Brett made his way to the ring, it was clear that everything had changed. His demeanour was not that of a man who was doing it all for the fans. Brett had lost hope and this was clear to see on his face. For me, this is the turning point for the entire story. Everything that came before saw Brett as the hero, but now, now things were different for the first time. Later in December, Sean and Brett once again came face to face, as Hart finally let loose and told Michaels and the entire wrestling world how he felt on an episode of Raw. In a segment which also featured a heated encounter between The Undertaker and Psycho Sid as the four men's rivalries became entangled. During this segment, Bret Hart really began to look different from his ring general hitman persona, trading his classic pink and black singlet for a biker style jacket, bare chest and classic 90s stonewashed denim jeans. The animosity continued into 1997 where, in January at the Royal Rumble, Stone Cold Steve Austin won by last eliminating Bret Hart. After in fact, Bret had first eliminated Stone Cold, something that the referees claimed to have missed. This moment was seen from Bret's point of view as another low point. He believed that he had been betrayed by the referee officiating the match and by extension his employers WWF. If you put the letter S in front of Hitman, you've had my exact opinion of Bret Hart. So you can imagine how impactful it was when we saw two characters who were very set in their ways through most of their careers, wrestling icons Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret the Hitman Hart, enter into a match at WrestleMania 13 in 1997 and both made the turn. As Stone Cold exploded onto the scene in WWF in 1996, none had made quite the impact which he had. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. As the king of the ring, I'm serving notice to every one of the superstars. They're all on the list, and I'm fixing to start running through all of them. Steve Austin's time has come, and that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Seeing Steve Austin rocketed to the main event status by the time WrestleMania rolled around, Bret Hart by this time was already a wrestling legend and had cemented his place throughout the neon 90s as a man who stood for honour, sportsmanship and honest wrestling. When the two men faced off at WrestleMania in a brutal submission match, refereed by MMA and Pro Wrestling Hall of Famer Ken Shamrock, the eyes of the wrestling world were glued to the television. As the match drew to a close, Bret Hart, the more proficient technical wrestler, caught Stone Cold in a sharpshooter submission in the middle of the ring. By this time, the aggressiveness of the match had split Stone Cold's head wide open, 
and he was pouring blood all over the mat. Bret Hart, the noble sportsman who only ever wanted to win a match legitimately and never cause unneeded pain to his foes, held the submission in tight, twisting the cartilage and muscles in Stone Cold's legs through the torturous pain, that which could be seen through the blood-soaked face of Stone Cold and heard through his yells and cries for mercy. Bret Hart, not bending any rules, continued to firmly sit in on the submission, but yet his opponent didn't yield, he didn't tap out or quit. Stone Cold's brain had had enough and he passed into unconsciousness. The match was over. Stone Cold had lost the prestigious match, but had won the hearts of the fans due to his pure desire to not give in. Even when faced with impossible odds, he was revered as a hero amongst the fans and, and from this point grew into the most popular performer in WWE's long history. Bret Hart, on the other hand, had gone too far. He attacked Stone Cold after the bell inflicted more damage to his legs. He had risked his opponent's health and jeopardized his career in order to succeed, something which we'd not seen before, an uglier side of Bret Hart which soured his on-screen relationship with the fans and turned him into an American-hating bad guy for a stretch of his career. Two men pulling off a masterclass of acting and performance to give us fans one of the most memorable and exhilarating moments in WrestleMania history. The perfect example of the small differences between a perceived good and evil character within a story and the fact that sometimes the smallest change can make all of the difference in their trajectory throughout a narrative. Sean and Brett took to the ring again during a March edition of Raw, the two men's anger getting the better of them as their hatred for one another turned from aggressive words on the microphone to blows with their fists. Vince McMahon, I managed to spit in his face out of just, just contempt and, and uh, I was just so So that familiar. wasn't part of the story? No, no, not at all part of the story. I was just... By May, Brett's turn to the dark side was in full effect. When Sean made his way to the ring to address the fans live on Raw, Hart and his contemporaries followed him and delivered a dastardly beatdown to Hart's longtime enemy. A few months later, with Brett held up in a wheelchair, his passion for the hatred inside of himself continued to grow. In a now infamous segment on Raw, Brett rolled to the ring and berated Sean and the fans for the way in which they had changed pro wrestling. Brett blamed Michaels for WWF's turn towards the Attitude Era and the darker sides of entertainment. Brett, in real life, never enjoyed the smart and sexual exploitation which fans in the mid-90s seemed so interested in. This bled into the storylines on screen and Hart, rightfully, put Sean as the spearhead of pro wrestling's new adult themed direction. Not willing to back down from a fight, Michaels made his way to join Hart in the ring and the segment ended with the hitman pushed from his wheelchair and laid out in the middle of the ring. I was in a position a little over a year ago to sign with the WCW for uh, considerable, almost double, well, more than double the money, and I turned it down out of loyalty, out of respect for Vince McMahon and the WWF. Nine months later into my contract, the WWF came to me and basically said, we are, due to financial problems, we are going to break your contract. By the time SummerSlam rolled around in the summer of 1997, the animosity between Michaels and Hart had reached fever pitch. So, when Sean allowed Brett to beat The Undertaker to win the WWF Championship in a match that featured Shawn Michaels as the referee, it further added subtext to this intriguing competition. For more on this topic, I'd like to hear from my good friend who above all else loves wrestling. His name, I Hate Wrestling. It's the summer of 1997. Undertaker is WWF champion, Bret Hart is challenging him for the title in the Summer Slam, Shawn Michaels is the special referee. If Bret Hart loses, he can never wrestle in the United States ever again. If Shawn Michaels shows any favor to The Undertaker because he has beef with Bret Hart, he can never wrestle in the US again either. It's Monday again, and 12,588 fans fill the igloo in Pittsburgh for Raw. Your commentators are Vincent McMahon, James Ross, and Jerry the King Lawler. Your ring announcer is Anthony Chamel. The Hart Foundation yet again starts the show to some nuclear heat. JR fills the plot hole of why Brett isn't in trouble for fighting Vince last week. It's because it, quote, wouldn't be fair to the fans to take away the match at SummerSlam. 
However, after SummerSlam, there will be a new WWF commissioner appointed, and Brett's situation will be reevaluated at that time. And what does Brett have to say for himself to these American fans? Not nice things. He says America is a place where the deck is stacked against you. I mean... He now claims when he said he'd never wrestle in the US ever again, if he lost at SummerSlam, he meant it figuratively. Two seconds later, without a hint of irony in his voice, he says Canadians stick to their word. What a bitch. I love it. Brett then has a great line about enemas. He makes a challenge to the Patriot for tonight and promises to bring the title back to Canada at SummerSlam. We surveyed 100 Americans. Who will win the WWF title match at SummerSlam? Top four answers are on the board. And they are really making us Americans look good and not creepy or cringy or xenophobic or coked out at all. Nah, it's cool. Here's a fun fact for you. The Truth Commission debuts on this show against the dream team of Road Dog, Flash Funk, and Bob Holly. They're from South Africa, you know, because apartheid. Get it? Later in the second hour, we get a video package about The Undertaker, because he's not here. Again. Well, actually, yes he is, but n not really. We got some sports-like interview footage of Brett, Sean, and British Bulldog putting over The Undertaker as an athlete and a wrestler and we get a bunch of old clips showing us what they're talking about. It has a very serious tone. JR calls this match the biggest showdown of the year. If only he knew. One man emerging from the dark side, another threatening to disappear. Heart and soul is clearly becoming a crossroads match in World Wrestling Federation history. This little package is the only segment thus far entirely dedicated to the main event of SummerSlam. Everything else we've seen up to this point has had multiple things going on. It seems to me that they felt they didn't need to do much to build the match because Brett vs. Taker is enough of a big deal on its own. We'll get to that in a minute though. Up to this point, almost all of the actual build, that is, what they present to us on their TV show, has been between Brett and Sean and the tension behind their stipulations. You know, if either of them screws up, they're fucked. Speaking of fucked, Shawn Michaels comes out for yet another long-winded self-serving promo. Vince asks him if he'll apologize for the things he said about Canada last week, and Sean's like, fuck that. He takes five minutes to say he'll join them for color commentary for Brett's upcoming match with the Patriot. What a matchup that should be. Meanwhile, Brett's backstage throwing a temper tantrum. How dare Sean not apologize to him, and how dare he be at ringside and talk over his next match. Oh boy, can you feel the heat rising for SummerSlam? These fucking guys can. Main event time. Brett comes out and immediately tells Vince something along the lines of keep that fuckface away from me while Sean acts like a fuckface. Brett plays the Canadian National Anthem and the Patriot calls him with the American National Anthem. Brett sneak attacks the Patriot during the song though and it awkwardly continues to play as Brett gets some heel heat. The crowd pops at the end of the song like normal and chants USA just about completely ignoring what's happening in the ring. It's weird. Talking about SummerSlam on commentary, Shawn Michaels tells Vince he can be, quote, as honest as the next guy while his tongue is planted firmly in his cheek. Patriot, despite getting the shit kicked out of him, is showing that babyface fire. He scores the Patriot missile, which is a flying shoulder tackle off the top rope, and he gets a two count for it. Now the Patriot's firmly in control as we go to commercial break. Back from the break and Brett's on offense again after using that dastardly figure four around the ring post during commercial. Sean asks, how hard can it be to be a referee? He then says he'll be unbiased and he'll call it down the middle, quote, as Sean Michaels sees it. I'm sure Brett feels much better about the whole thing now. Patriots being painted by commentary as an underdog, not exactly in the league of Bret Hart. Ah, so my eyes don't deceive me. Thanks for that. Speaking of success, they try the WrestleMania 8 finish and turn it into a ref bump, but Patriot can't hold Brett up and Brett falls on his dick. Brett then pile drives his ass as Raw passes the two hour mark and goes into an overrun. Brett headbutts Patriot's dick for good measure. Jesus, none of this sounded so homoerotic until I said it out loud. Earl Hebner sells like he got shot with a gun or something. He slowly counts one, then Shawn Michaels pulls Brett off the Patriot to break the count. Oh boy. Brett's like, come on, let's fight, to Shawn, all distracted from the match, and the Patriot rolls him up. Even with the slowest count in the world for a roll up because Earl is on the verge of death, the Patriot gets three and upsets Bret Hart. America rejoices as Kurt Angle's future music hits and Sean provokes Brett. There's a bunch of officials out to keep them separated and things are tense. Suddenly, The Undertaker's music hits and aw oh, shit son, here we go, finally. All three of them are out at the same time after all this time. And yeah, no, you're gonna have to pay to see that. 
The live crowd got to see The Undertaker defeat Bret Hart and Stone Cold in a triple threat match for the WWF title right after Raw went off the air like this. But if you're just at home, fuck off, buy the pay-per-view. Ladies and gentlemen, there were no house shows the last week of July in 97, so here we are. The WWF is live on pay-per-view in New Jersey for the first time since SummerSlam 89. Around that time, the state of New Jersey enacted a $100,000 tax for putting on televised events regulated by the athletic board, such as wrestling, boxing, and martial arts, and thus we only have house shows for the next eight years. However, back in March of 97, Governor Christine Todd Whitman, with the lobbying of the WWF, signed a bill that officially recognized professional wrestling as entertainment and not a sport, thus excluding them from the tax and the rules of the athletic board. In other words, WWF was completely deregulated in New Jersey. No more taxes, fees, oversight, mandatory physicals, or licenses required. The Undertaker presided over the bill signing ceremony. No matter where on the political spectrum you fall, the jokes write themselves. We get a classic video package opening the show. If life were fair, Bret Hart wouldn't be hated by America, Undertaker wouldn't be blackmailed by Paul Bear, and Shawn Michaels wouldn't have to fake a knee injury. That video package. It's dope. Watch it. Let's take this time to quickly recap, shall we? Undertaker's been champion since WrestleMania 13 in March, but his reign lies in the shadow of Paul Bear torturing him. Bret Hart blames America, and Vince, and Shawn for all of his problems. Shawn Michaels really hates Bret Hart. Bret openly volunteers to never wrestle in the US again if he loses at SummerSlam, then he tries to take it back once Shawn is appointed the referee, but he can't because it was already put in his contract. Sean has to call it down the middle though, or else he's gone too, and that will be difficult for him because Sean has no self-control whatsoever. On top of all this, Bret vs Undertaker is bound to be a hell of a match by itself. Bret calls it the biggest match either of them has ever had up to this point. So yeah, this one's a doozy. They're really relying heavily on the tension between Bret and Sean, while the Undertaker's really just kinda there because he's the champion. They knew Bret vs Taker was a big money match by itself at the time, so they figured they didn't need to do much to build that aspect of it. The real meat and potatoes of this one is actually Bret and Sean. And now, Cotton Rounds Soaked in Rubbing Alcohol presents SummerSlam, Heart and Soul. The Meadowlands in East Rutherford, New Jersey is sold out with 20,213 people jammed to the rafters. We got the classic 90s entrance tunnel thing with the angled aisleway. We got Red Ropes, the original blue SummerSlam aprons, this was the last time they'd be used, and Black Ring Posts, which I find to be an oddly unsettling combination. Black Barred Barricades, Black Mats, and the commentary tables are still just normal tables. Blimp with the sponsor on it, check. Vlad the Superfan, check. Faith No More Guy, check. Yep, passes the test. We got ourselves a genuine 1990s WWF pay-per-view. Your commentators for this evening are Vince McMahon, Jim Ross, and Jerry Lawler. Your ring announcer is good old Howard Finkel. About halfway through the pay-per-view, Shawn Michaels is in the back with Todd Pettengill. He basically reiterates what he said on commentary on Raw, except now he sounds a little more serious. Just before the main event, we get a video package explaining the story a hell of a lot better than I just did. The commentators talk up the big stipulations for this match, and Vince says we're, quote, in the shadow of New York City for like the 10th time tonight. Brett's out first, and he dedicates this match to Canada and everyone who hates America, and he has them play the Canadian National Anthem. The crowd is less than respectful. Making his entrance next is the referee. Vince drops, quote, Many individuals feel Shawn Michaels personifies the exuberance in America's youth today. Okay, Vince, I'm sure many individuals have told you that. JR says now all the other referees are going to want pyro, and Lawler says Hebner would look good in front of a Roman candle. Which I, you know, that's funny. JR reminds us that Sean has never refereed a match in his life, and Brett should be worried. Will his inexperience come into play? I guess we'll find out. And finally, the champion makes his grand entrance. Brett can't hide his own goosebumps. Sean wants to check Brett for foreign objects, and this annoys Brett. It's almost like Sean is trying too hard. Whether that's because his career is on the line, or it's because he's an obnoxious prick, remains to be seen. Brett, like the desperate man he is, goozles Taker before the bell and Sean breaks it up. The fight is underway and the bell finally sounds. His advantage doesn't last long as he eats some punches and a clothesline. He rolls out of the ring like, fuck, well there goes that plan. Taker follows him and throws him into the rail. Sean threatens to DQ him and begins his 10 count, so no bias so far. Brett sidesteps Taker and Taker runs straight into the ring post. Brett follows that up by throwing Taker into the steel steps. 
Brett breaks the count and tries to jump on Taker from the apron, but that goddamn Undertaker catches him and plants him spine first into the ring post. Sean, perhaps a little overzealous, tries to grab Taker by the hair to bring him inside, but immediately thinks better of it. Undertaker's firmly on offense now. We get some punches, a backbreaker, and a bear hug. Unable to do anything else, Brett bites Taker's nose to free himself. Can he capitalize, though? No. He eats another big boot. Taker misses an elbow drop, and that buys Brett another second, but Taker's like, fuck that. Goes for another big boot, but Brett has it scouted this time, and he kicks Taker's leg out of his leg. Here we go. Now Brett's got it. With visions of sharpshooters dancing in his head, he begins ripping and tearing Taker's left knee. He then slaps on a figure four leg lock, and that would be Paul Bear's cue. Oh shit, are we gonna see Kane? Undertaker sees Bear, and this fires him up, enabling him to reverse the figure four. Brett grabs the ropes, and Taker slams Brett's leg into the mat for an exclamation point because he needs the time to kick Paul Bear's ass. Bear bumps like a bowling pin. Brett seizes the opportunity and chop blocks Taker on the outside, as officials take Paul Bear away from ringside. I guess no cane. Bummer. Whatever though, there's already enough shit to keep track of. Brett slaps on a figure four around the ring post. Sean counts to four and Brett lets go. They get in each other's faces and aw yeah, here we go, but Sean didn't actually do anything wrong, so never mind. Brett lets it go. Reinforcements arrive as Brian Pillman and Owen Hart now show up at ringside. Sean is very aware of them, perhaps too aware. They don't have anything to do yet because currently Brett's fucking up Taker's knee. He wraps it around the ring post and Sean tells him, I am the law around here. Something tells me Sean is getting a real kick out of all this shit. Brett's got a leg lock on and Taker tries to pull his hair, but Sean says, no, no, no. There's a moment where Sean is distracted by the Hart Foundation and Undertaker goes to pull Brett's hair again, but Sean turns back around and Taker pulls back. Subtle. I appreciate it. Taker eventually breaks the hold, violently stomping Brett's face like he's friggin' making wine with it or something. And with that, Taker goes outside and preemptively strikes Owen and Pillman. Sean gets involved and sends them both to the back. While Sean's preoccupied in the aisle, Undertaker nails a chokeslam on Brett in the ring. This could be over, but Sean's inexperience as a referee comes into play as he misses the count. Taker's like, you motherfucker, and grabs Sean, but Brett rolls him up. Two count. They almost got me with that one. Brett now decides to go for Taker's back, ramming it into the apron in the ring post. Sean tells Brett his patience is wearing thin with him, that he's not afraid to DQ him, and to get his ass back inside the ring. Brett's seething, and he's just like, ugh, shut the fuck up. He continues to work over Taker's back with a double axe, some headbutts, and a backbreaker. Two count, and Taker sits up. Suplex and a fist drop from Brett's rope. Two count, and Taker sits up again. DDT. Hey, that's still kinda not really a finishing move in 1997 WWF. Two count, and yet again, Taker sits up. Brett's doing some serious mouth breathing by this point, which means we must be getting close to the finish. Brett takes too much time, and out of desperation, Undertaker hotshots him into the turnbuckle. Hoping that's enough, he pins him, but only gets two. Back on their feet, and Brett manages to regain control by going after Taker's injured back. He decides it's time for a sharpshooter, but Taker thwarts it, grabbing him by the throat and standing up. Brett stops a chokeslam attempt by kicking Taker's leg, but Taker gets a bunch of punches in and drops Brett. Flying clothesline by Taker. Brett takes the turnbuckle chest first, the way only Bret Hart can, and Taker gets a two count. Get a whip, big boot, and a leg drop, brother, and that's only a two count in the WWF in 1997, and JR confirms this by complimenting Sean's deliberate and consistent count. Brett takes a breather on the apron, and The Undertaker chokeslams his ass over the top rope into the center of the ring. It takes him a second to get the pin, though, and he pays for that by only getting a two. Undertaker goes for old school, which even in 1997, JR was calling Vintage Undertaker, but Brett crotches him. Brett goes for a superplex, they almost eat shit, but Brett saves it and heaves his big ass over. They're both down, but Brett's up at six. Taker's pulling out choke slams now, so Brett senses the urgency. Sharpshooter in the center of the ring now. Taker sells with his face down and actually manages to power out of the hold, sending Brett flying through the ropes and to the outside with his legs. Brett yells, fuck! Nobody has ever broken the sharpshooter before, and after working Taker's back and leg for all this time. It's actually a big deal. Pissed, Brett gets back in and starts wailing on Taker. A whip is reversed and Taker clotheslines Brett, collapsing immediately afterward, but trying to stumble back to his feet. Taker feels like he needs to end it now. Tombstone! Brett slides down his back and takes out Taker's legs. Brett pulls him into the corner for the most ill-fated move I have ever seen. A sharpshooter wrapped around the ring post. Sean counts for the DQ and just before he gets to five, Taker breaks the hold again and sends Brett flying into Sean. Sean's out temporarily now, and Brett sees this opportunity. He grabs a chair and nails Taker across the skull with it. 
Sean gets back in and counts only two. Brett's like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Sean then sees the chair in the corner of the ring and begins to interrogate Brett. Brett's like, I don't know where that came from. I don't know what you're talking about. And Sean just isn't buying it. Brett loses his composure and nails Sean in the face with a gumball-sized loogie, causing Sean to lose his composure and swing the chair. Brett ducks and Sean nails Undertaker. Sean's like, shit, and Brett's like, hey, wow, thanks, now count the pin. With his career on the line, Sean reluctantly counts the pin, gets three, and Bret Hart becomes the WWF champion for a fifth time. Sean immediately walks to the back in anger and disgust. Undertaker follows him. Brett drapes himself in the maple leaf and celebrates in the ring, looking incredibly relieved, as the New Jersey fans pelt him with garbage. The Hart Foundation, Sans Neidhart, joins him as everybody except for America allegedly rejoices. Thanks for watching SummerSlam. The finish was allegedly Sean's idea. They needed a reason for Sean to lose his composure and swing the chair, and Sean suggested being spit at. Surprisingly, everybody got along, worked together, and did business like professionals that night. How sweet. In the background, some tension was building between Sean and Brett, off screen. Brett wanted to agree with Michaels that some topics from each other's personal lives should remain private, and wanted to enforce a rule which would see both Michaels and Hart refraining from involving each other's families in on-screen storylines. However, Shawn Michaels has always been a showman. He has always known just exactly what it takes to entice audiences and ensure that pro wrestling stays fresh and exciting. Although the pair spoke at length about Hart's desire for a certain level of privacy, Shawn knew that bleeding the line between fact and fantasy was where the world of pro wrestling was heading. And he was right. I think I was sorry when I signed the deal. Brett had leveraged himself against Turner's operation and bid himself up so much, and everyone around me at that time was saying, oh, my, you can't let Brett go. I listened to them. I think I'm sorry that I did. At one night only, Shawn Michaels decided to make the feud once again about family insisting on challenging Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog, Bret Hart's brother-in-law, to a title match for the Bulldog's European belt. A match which saw Michaels picking up the victory with Triple H and China ringside, and one which, backstage, infuriated Bret, who seemingly began to confuse in-ring storytelling with a personal attack against him and his loved ones. Something which, to this day, seems to be a recurring theme whenever you hear the hitman talking about pro wrestling, and especially when you hear him talk about all of the events that occurred in 1997. Bret Hart admits that during this time, he began to allow his ego to take over, and has always said he found it difficult to distinguish between Bret Hart the wrestler and Bret Hart the man. The next week on Raw, as Sean and Triple H made their way to the ring to show off Michael's new shiny European belt, Brett and the Hart family had seen enough of their brashy, cocky celebrations. As the Hearts stood on the ramp, we were left with this famous image from Michaels and Triple H, who seemingly didn't care about the Hearts' threats and lauded their recent victories over their family. This cockiness shown by Michaels and Hunter shows a glimpse into the attitude that made the Attitude Era. The fans ate it up and enjoyed the direction in which the company was now clearly headed, but Brett, Brett didn't. On Raw in October, Brett decided to play by Sean's rules and went after his nearest and dearest, challenging Triple H to a match, one in which, given Hart's statue within the company and Triple H's then role as Michael's sidekick, was seemingly unbalanced and a threat made to teach Michaels a lesson. Later that night, as Triple H and Brett faced off, Sean did everything within his power ringside to cause a distraction and hurt Brett's feelings. If there was anything that Brett loved as much as his family and pro wrestling, it was Canada. So when Michaels began to degrade Hart's beloved home country, holding up a sign that said Canada sucks, the feud only began to grow more deeply personal. Sean blew his nose on the Canadian flag, something which infuriated Brett, and when China and Michaels helped Triple H win via countout, it left Brett and his family enraged. Off the record with Michael Lansford. 
A week before the Survivor Series in Montreal, and wrestling fans are buzzing on the card is Bret Hart and the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels. But the real fight is between Hart and the king of the WWF, Vince McMahon. Hart says it's a raunchier, sleazier WWF, not fit for kids. Hart fired the opening salvo, challenging the creative direction that McMahon is taking wrestling. During this time, Brett began to communicate with Vince McMahon about his lack of confidence in the way in which WWF was developing, and even spoke about his uncertainty about his place on the roster. As the pair continued to have heated exchanges backstage, the animosity continued to build, something which those closest to the situation began to notice. Brett said, I trusted Vince, but there were things leading up to the screw job that I just couldn't trust. It was just getting very hard to believe anything he said. I tried not to leave. I didn't want to leave, and I kind of got pushed out, and I kind of felt, even before the screw job happened, that I felt betrayed. Everything I'd delivered for him, I gave so much, and I really felt that he didn't come through. McMahon's integrity was pretty shoddy. The following week on Raw, as Brett and his brother Owen were in the ring, the live feed cut to a backstage camera where we saw Sean sitting with his allies Triple H and China, the friends declaring that the new age of pro wrestling had officially begun, and that they would be the heads of a new generation, known as D-Generation X. In hindsight, DX would become one of the most influential parts of the entire pro wrestling world, both on screen and behind the scenes, and would help revolutionise the way in which the art form was presented, for better and for worse. DX represented everything that Brett saw was wrong with not just pro wrestling, but with popular culture in general at the time. He admitted that this was the point where in real life, he decided to not let his children continue to watch WWF, as the programming, in his opinion, had become too violent, too sexual, and too full of adult themes. Brett has every right to feel how he did, however, that doesn't change the fact that, from this point on, pro wrestling was entering into its most popular period of all time, and an era which would change the landscape of WWF forever. It was around this time that World Championship Wrestling made a large offer towards Brett, promising a contract that financially far overshadowed his current WWF paycheck, but Brett was undecided. He was going to stay loyal to WWF even if he hadn't been treated the best in recent months in his opinion. Brett was an honourable man and wasn't going to turn his back on those who had paid his wages for so many years. At this point, Brett was offered a contract which would last longer than any other WWF contract ever signed and would be guaranteed a paycheck every month for 10 years. But this didn't stop Vincent McMahon, long-standing owner and chairman of WWE and Brett, to come to a standstill over new contract negotiations. With the clock running out on Hart's duties, neither man was willing to budge. Hart was willing to hand over the title via loss and even said he'd do so after his contract had expired. However, due to the previous conflicts with Shawn Michaels, his only stipulation is that he wouldn't drop the belt to HBK in Canada. This led to a situation where WWF's main champion was about to be out of contract and still in possession of its most important and historical belt. With WCW circling, Vince McMahon didn't want to lose one of his biggest stars and his biggest titles at the same time, so he made an industry-changing decision. One that not only changed the fate of Bret Hart, but those around him. Long-standing showrunner and WWE executive Bruce Pritchard said at the time, he told us that he would lose it to the perennial jobber Brooklyn Brawler in Madison Square Garden, but that he wouldn't drop the title to Sean in Canada. There was an uneasiness because Brett had been pretty difficult all week. It was a constant negotiation. Brett would agree, then he'd disagree. He'd agree, then disagree. He'd agree, then call back and say, no, I don't want to do that. It was a lot of giving and take all week, trying to get to the point that we needed it to get to. 
It was a situation where Brett didn't want to lose in Canada, Jim Cornette mentioned. He didn't want to lose before the pay-per-view because he didn't want to disappoint his fans because he was advertised as champion. I didn't want him to go to WCW with our championship, Vince McMahon said in an interview. So the request for Brett would be, OK, let's drop this championship back to someone in WWF where it belongs. And that didn't happen, so I had to do what I had to do. It's no different than an actor in a television series who, at the end of it, refuses to die or refuses to do the job, so to speak. What do you do? As the old entertainment business saying goes, the show must go on. So, whilst all of these heated contract negotiations were turning into fully-fledged arguments behind the scenes, the storyline of Sean vs Brett continued to play out. At the beginning of November, after countless hours spent on the telephone and in the office of Vince McMahon, Brett made his decision, one which must have felt like the ultimate gamble as he took his pride and his creative control in his hand and signed with WWF's biggest rivals, WCW. To most WWF fans, wrestlers and backroom staff, this was the ultimate betrayal, a moment which saw Brett acting in his own interests, both in terms of his wrestling career and financially. Brett would continue on for the next month after sending a fax to Vincent McMahon, informing him of his final decision on his way to receiving a guaranteed $3 million per year contract down in Orlando, something which is said to have hurt the personal feelings of McMahon, who believed he'd always done right by Brett. Say what you will about Vincent Kennedy McMahon, but the businessman has assembled an empire through almost half a century as the figurehead of the WWF and now WWE. The man is a billionaire and knows how ruthless one must be in order to steer such an enormous ship. Brett was still being elusive on the week leading into Survivor Series in 1997. He was heading towards WCW but wasn't willing to give a solid answer when questioned about his plan for dropping the belt. McMahon was backed into a corner from his point of view if Brett wasn't willing to operate in the way in which most benefited his company, then McMahon must act in order to correct the company's course. So there's nothing until Saturday, and then there's the production meeting. And of course, you know, we come in at the end of the production meeting and they're dismissing it and all that kind of stuff, and then all of a sudden everybody's gone and it's just me, Vince, and Jerry Briscoe, and, and Hunter. Vince McMahon held a meeting at the hotel with Jim Ross, Jim Cornette, Pat Patterson and Michaels. Reports are that at least two of the aforementioned names look extremely uncomfortable leaving that meeting, wrote respected wrestling journalist Dave Meltzer in his Wrestling Observer newsletter. Shawn Michaels said to ESPN, I just recall up to that point there being a big scuttlebutt over what's going to happen with Brett leaving. And then, of course, was, I guess, an infamous phone call between myself, Hunter and Vince. I want to say it was just the week before. We had the meeting and as everyone was leaving, Vince asked me, Hunter and Jerry Briscoe, a long-time agent and close confidant of Vince, to stay. We sat down and talked, Michaels wrote in his autobiography. Pat was in the room with us earlier and he had no idea what was about to happen. He had a strong relationship with Brett. He wouldn't have done it and Vince knew that, that's why he didn't tell Pat. It was agreed that to get the belt from Brett, some underhanded tactics would be needed, reminiscent of the old fashioned shoot wrestling events seen in the early days of the NWA. Sean was going to have to work out a way to win a match against Brett without Brett being a part of the finish and in a way which would ensure the belt changed hands at the upcoming Survivor Series pay per view. Vince McMahon had agreed to split the issue with Sean. McMahon would take all of the blame for the incident from fans and the wrestlers in the locker room. However, the owner of the company wasn't the one who would be physically in the ring opposite Brett, and thus, the final decision on how things played out laid at the feet of Shawn Michaels. 
When the morning of the 9th of November 1997 arrived, wrestling fans around the world were still unaware that only a few hours later, the WWF and by extension the entire pro wrestling universe was about to change. Sean said, It was probably the most uncomfortable day I've ever had in the wrestling business. By the time the day comes, the decisions had been made, but no one knows how it's going to get done until Brett and I start to sit down to discuss the match. None of this can actually go into play until we do that, and so it was just an uncomfortable day knowing what you know, how others assume it's going to happen, and then you having to be the one to orchestrate it all. Brett came later than usual and so the process of being able to find out what in heaven's name was going to happen or how we were going to do this was prolonged even longer because we didn't know what was going to happen until we sat down. For most of the wrestlers on the roster it would have felt like just another pay per view event where they were expected to go out to the ring and perform for the entertainment of the fans. However, for Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, the mood that day would have been incredibly tense. It was about 7 o'clock when I walked into the locker room, Michaels wrote in his autobiography. There were only a few people in there and none were close to Earl. He was putting on his referee's gear and I started to put my boots on. Oh, I need you to listen to me very carefully. I was speaking very softly. We are doing a big swerve tonight. I'm going to get Bret in the sharpshooter and I need you to ring the bell. Have you ever had the feeling that someone was lying to your face? That feeling of awkwardness and discomfort where you want to call them out but you don't fully understand why. Brett had to have felt that something was off that day. As he made his way through the arena and into the locker room, I imagine the air in that room would have felt very different to usual. But he could have in no way known what was about to happen. With the Survivor Series show running smoothly, Brett and Sean got into their ring attire and nervously awaited their call for their hotly anticipated match. Bret Hart said, I was getting ready to go through the curtain when they circled Earl and basically told him this was how the match was going to go down. They also reminded him that he was mic'd with a microphone behind his ear so they could hear everything he said. If he did anything to tip me off, they'd fire him. As the two men's music hit, fans were jubilant to see their favourites perform. As they made their way to the ring, it felt like a big match with a lot on the line, but nobody could have predicted just how much was at stake. The bell rung and the match began, and even with the knowledge of what was about to occur, looking back, the match doesn't stand out as anything other than the classic confrontations we'd grown to expect from these two expert wrestlers. A back and forth contest with Brett and Sean both doing their best to put on a display worthy of the main event. Throughout the match, Brett's ears must have been ringing. He couldn't stop thinking about what was said to him by a fellow wrestler just as he exited through the curtains a few moments prior. Be careful out there, Vince has a tendency to screw people over in these types of situation. Why had Vader mentioned that to him on this night? What did it mean? And why could Brett not shake the feeling that he was caught in the middle of something that was now completely out of his control? I'm sure most of you are familiar with this wrestling universe altering event. What happened next is possibly the most memorable and heavily speculated upon event in all of wrestling's vast history. In the Molson Centre in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, the home country of the Hitman, saw Brett captured by Sean in Brett's iconic sharpshooter submission for a brief second before referee Earl Hebner gave the signal to ring the bell and declared Sean Michaels the victor and the new WWF champion. In the, right in the middle of my match, which to make it even more humiliating, had Sean Michaels put me in my hold, uh, <coughs> right in the middle of me getting out of it. They rang the bell, Vince McMahon ordered the timekeeper to ring the bell, the referee bolted back to the dressing room, Shawn Michaels bolted back to the dressing room. When the Montreal screw job occurred, I wanted to make sure that Brett saw me out at ringside and know that what I did was the right thing to do, at least from my standpoint. A truly villainous move on your average show, but when the ref Earl Hebner signalled that Bret Hart had submitted, 
the arena deflated with confusion. Brett clearly hadn't tapped out or shouted that he submitted. He hadn't made any gestures toward the officials and was only in the hold for a second or two. He knew instantly that he'd been screwed. The men and women in the locker room knew what had happened and chaos broke out behind the curtain as the screw job was still taking place. Watching it, I thought it was a mistake. I'm watching for a spot and then all of a sudden the bell rings, so I'm trying to talk to the truck, to the timekeeper. I'm trying to find out what's going on. In the meantime, I've got Davy Boy in front of me and he's going, they fooked him, they fooked Brett. What do we do? And I had no clue. I just kind of sat there for a minute and then I said, I guess fucking go out, I don't know, explained Bruce Pritchard, who was as confused as any of the wrestlers backstage at the time. In this moment, Brett lost the WWF Championship to Shawn Michaels, but that wasn't the reason that Hart tried to wrestle Shawn to the mat after the bell. Shot straight over to loom over Vincent McMahon, who had made the call ringside. Then, Brett spat in his face. A disgusting display of aggression from Brett as he brought up a vile wad of phlegm and delivered a sharp shot of his own, spitting to outside the ring like a sniper, landing in the hair and eye of his boss. Brett knew that he'd been betrayed. Barring some run-ins with wrestler's biggest wanker Hulk Hogan, the industry famous backstabbing Brett had up to this point managed to avoid, in part due to his own decisions had finally caught up to him. As Vince McMahon wiped the gauze from his brow, all hell broke loose. It was so startling. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember, you know, we're, we're surrounded by hostile people. First of all, uh, they got us out of there because yeah. we were throwing stuff. And Brett came over and was, you know, destroyed the monitors as he was, he was irate. Yeah. He had a lot of family there. Brett climbed out of the ring and rained down destruction on the ringside area smashing up tables and throwing televisions on the ground in a fit of rage. The fans, realizing that something was up, began to boo and throw cups and bottles at Sean and Vince, who quickly realized they may have a riot on their hands. I got Sean out and Sean was walking. He was carrying the belt in front of him and they were, all, they were throwing shit out. I said, Sean, put the belt over your head. As all involved quickly made their exit towards the back room area, the Survivor Series show went off the air amidst anger and confusion. Brett, still furious, made his way to the locker room to find out what had happened. Well, I mean, it obviously changed everything for not only Brett, but wrestling, myself. It was a game changer, that's for sure. We didn't expect that to happen, really. Only to find himself face to face with Vince McMahon. I think Vince gambled that I was going to take the high road and say a few words to him and then I would walk out and grab my stuff and leave the dressing room and that would be the end of it and he could say, at least I confronted him. Somewhere in that conversation, I said, if you're still here after I get dressed, I'm going to punch you out. Vince feeling that he needed to let Brett calm down before he could explain himself made his way into his office where he says he awaited Hart and his family for a discussion. Vince said straight to me, this is the first time I've ever had to lie to one of my talents. I said, are you kidding me? Then I rattled off on every finger about 10 different lies he'd told me in the last week. Vince told me, what I did to you today won't hurt you, you'll still get all the money you're supposed to get from WCW. This only served to further confuse and anger Brett and led to a moment which is still a hot topic for debate with many wrestlers and WWE staff having separate accounts of what took place. However, the facts are that Bret Hart and Vince McMahon agree on one thing. As tensions boiled over, Bret could no longer be restrained and delivered a furious punch towards his boss, one that landed with an echoing thud. I could have hid, Vince McMahon said. I could have not gone out to the ring at all. I could have left the building and I could have done a lot of things. Brett gave me one punch right to the temple on the left side. Vince was already on his way. Um, you know, he was already on his way to come talk to to, to Brett about it. Um, of course, you know, all the boys are, you know, in an uproar. Honestly, the thing that I recall most is in the hotel room afterwards with Hunter, just sort of sitting there and taking it in, recalled Michaels. 
having the time to finally slow down and take in what actually happened. I was right smack dab in the middle of it. That just isn't the kind of attention and focus one desires. It just isn't a really enjoyable moment to be a part of the absolute most infamous thing in pro wrestling. The absolute biggest thing in the wrestling business just went down and holy cow, I can hardly imagine the impact and the freefall and the consequences of what was going to happen tomorrow. It's sort of a surreal moment, Michael said. You made the decision, you've got everything set and there's still a wrestling match. So you're out there doing your thing, which is again an unbelievably athletic and tough performance. And then on top of that, on top of already concealing who you really are in just doing your job, you have to conceal from the person you're working with any hint of what may or may not happen. It's one thing to make the decision to do this, it's a whole nother thing to actually have the person to make this happen and not have any idea about how you're going to go about doing that. And then, even if you're successful, it's absolutely going to be the worst thing that could ever happen to you, Michael said. From a professional standpoint, reputation standpoint, even though I wasn't the most lovable guy back then, it was still just an absolutely miserable day. A very uncomfortable day. <laughs> Well, I don't have to worry about the referee tomorrow because I talked to Earl. He swore on his kids that he's not going to let anything happen. And I can trust Earl. The man who had previously sworn to Brett's wife that nothing would happen during the match to negatively affect Brett. A man who had been in the ring with Sean and Brett during almost the entirety of this story together and been witness to all of the highs and lows. A man who had built a sacred bond with both men over decades of traveling and working together. I would have had to do the same thing to feed my family because you would have been on the streets out on the outside looking in if you didn't do it that you were told. I remember before the match, Jerry Briscoe had pulled over Earl. They went kind of under the bleachers. I was getting ready to walk over there thinking, are they talking about a certain spot or should I be involved in that? And then I kind of knew. Something's happening here. El Hebner was put into a painful and almost impossible position. El Hebner knew about what was going to happen. After all, it was Hebner who would ultimately be responsible for ending the match. I don't blame him for what he did. He was protecting his job and livelihood, and I believe that many would have done the same in El Hebner's position. However, his attitude towards the incident in the years since is what really sticks in the throats of many wrestling fans and Bret Hart's alike. An almost cocky demeanor comes over Hebner's face whenever he speaks about his actions in Montreal. He seemingly enjoyed the small slither of power that was granted to him that night, and in interviews almost sounds as if he wants to take credit for the way in which things played out. Sometimes I, I, got, I ask myself, why did I do it? You know, a lot of fans sure. always ask, why'd you screw Brett? Mm. And I would just look up and go, for the money. If you want to become a pro wrestler, you need a certain amount of trust. A trust in your opponent to play out the match in a way which was agreed upon beforehand. And more importantly, a trust that they can do everything within their power to keep you safe inside the ring. When the Montreal screw job happened, regardless of their position or view on the incident, many pro wrestlers said that the level of trust shared in the locker room drastically changed. You don't go into something like that not understanding the consequences, Michael said. You may end up having to fight your way out of the building or getting into a couple of fights or who knows. But one of the biggest things in the wrestling business is when you go out there with the guys, you're trusting one another with your bodies. Well, uh, it's it's really sad because I think um, people should understand. I think that somebody like myself, I had so much heart and soul sort of invested in the WWF, and uh, my. My, I take such pride in what I accomplished with the WWF, and I think to say that I was the the, the hardest working, most loyal, most dependable, most uh, you know the, it, inside the ring and outside the ring, I was the best. 
Now that time has passed and the air been cleared, the Montreal Screwjob has featured in countless wrestling documentaries and biographies, each putting a new spin on the events of exactly what happened at Survivor Series in 1997. I think the Screwjob was so compartmentalised that the guys that were in on it didn't even know who else was, Sean Walkman said. Since the heat has died down and people have realised that they can earn money and notoriety by giving their opinion on the proceedings, many have explained that they were part of the screw job when in fact they had nothing to do with it. You know, a lot of people take credit for it. I've had a lot of people come up to me and tell me that they were involved in it, like, I didn't want to say anything, but I was in on the whole thing. It's bullshit, Bret Hart said. I mean, the only guys that were in on it that I know of were Vince, Triple H, Sean of course and Jerry Briscoe. That's it, period. Earl Hebner got pulled in at the last minute when he walked out, but nobody else knew. Not even the TV guys, the producer, Kevin Dunn. Vince's TV guy didn't know anything about it until we were in the ring. Then I think they told them. Bruce Pritchard said, I was watching at gorilla position right behind the entrance's curtain with Davy Boy and Owen Hart. They were the only two people there and anyone who says that they were, wasn't there. It's hard to read between the lines. Pro wrestling was still shrouded in a cloud of mystery back in the late 90s and these performers and businessmen were experts at saying one thing whilst meaning another. I believe that the universe is completely random and not predetermined, but sometimes in the wrestling universe the stars seem to align. His greatest rival Shawn Michaels, the sharpshooter, Canada and Brett's last match all culminated in one of the biggest instances of double crossing and backstabbing ever seen in professional wrestling. On his way out of the door of WWF for his then final time, Brett walked backstage and gave Vince a black eye. He picked up his patented leather jacket and shades and rode off towards Orlando Studios and WCW. His first match in WCW was indicative of how the rest of his run with the company would go. Not the best of fits in terms of Hart's serious, hard-working mentality and WCW's locker room filled with party goers and egomaniacs. Brett's career was eventually ended when he clashed with Goldberg and received a serious brain injury in the ring, not a fitting end for such a lauded legend of the industry. Wrestling is a business built on a lie, says Joe Dombrowski, but it's a willing full lie that we all choose to believe that we're going to invest ourselves into the story. Wrestling's fake, I'm sure you've heard that a thousand times. The matches are predetermined and the wrestlers aren't actually trying their best to win. As fans, we're accepting of these facts, just as anyone who watches a televised drama or action movie would be. However, the misdirection and showmanship can oftentimes be much more complex than this. In the years since the Montreal Screwjob, many have speculated that the entire event was planned by not only Vince McMahon and Shawn Michaels, but Bret Hart as well. From the moment the incident occurred, Vince McMahon became the most hated man in all of pro wrestling, feeding the fire by expanding his on-screen role and playing up to the character of the horrible boss, something which would become a fundamental part of WWE's success over the next couple of decades. Shawn Michaels did similarly, with even the most die-hard fans believing that what he did was ethically wrong. The heartbreak kid became even more of a smarmy heel over the next few years, representing everything that Canadian fans hated about American pro wrestling and receiving unmatched levels of heat whenever he appeared in Hart's home country. Bret Hart was supposed to go on to a blistering career within WCW, using his support from the fans and hatred of the WWF to become their biggest star and although circumstances out of his control stopped him from doing so, nevertheless, Hart had already signed with World Championship Wrestling when the screw job happened, and had nothing left to achieve in the company where he had first made his name on a global scale. Brett benefited in the short term from what happened at Survivor Series as much as Sean or Vince did, and to top it all off, there was a camera crew making a documentary the entire time 
leading up to the event and in the days following. Some have since said that this documentary was another way to guarantee that a certain narrative was agreed upon and find it too much of a coincidence that the film crew just happened to capture the events of the Montreal Screwjob with such great clarity. The film crew even captured the footage backstage of Brett and Vince's confrontation and crucially got to witness the moment in which Vince left his office after being smacked around the face by Brett. It was way too quick for Vince having such a black eye. It was set up beforehand. They knew it was going to happen and, and Chris Candido and I always said, we bet you that Vince had his own son punch him in the eye, make it look good and make it come out, so it would look like Brett did it. Even those within the closest of secretive circles backstage in WWE are unsure to this day. The secrets regarding the Montreal screw job and the reality of what happened still left in the shadows. If they were working, they were working me too, Bruce Pritchard said on his podcast. In the years since the Montreal screw job, the incident has become iconic, a moment which has been parodied and replicated discussed and argued about ad nauseum. Brett and Sean eventually sat down with Jim Ross and during a televised interview hashed out their grievances. Both men carried the weight of what happened that night for decades and have admitted that the negativity surrounding the event weighed heavily upon them. Speculations still rife within the wrestling community about the truth of what happened that night and why, and to be honest, I don't think we'll ever know the full story. Was what happened in Montreal a breach of trust and brotherhood which destroyed the lives of those involved, causing years of mental anguish, leaving a dark mark on the wrestling industry which will never be erased? Or was the screw job in fact a masterfully orchestrated moment of expert storytelling which was so perfectly played out that even those who were the most closely involved never saw it coming. What do you think? I think the legacy of the screw job is it's, it's going to stand as one of the most pivotal moments in wrestling history. 